Thanks everyone for coming tonight. Um, unfortunately, I could only join remotely tonight, um, but welcome to a how did your Linux installation go meeting. We have first up Tom, um, who's talking about Linux, the latest Linux Mint version, and then later on um, Ian, who will talk about his Ubuntu experience um, with dual booting and so on. So first of all, um, I also want to thank our sponsors, as always, <laughs> the people that are actually up at uni. Um, thanks um, to Computing and Mathematical Sciences for sponsoring the room there, and the New Zealand Open Source Society for running the Big Blue Button instance that we're actually using here for our online session here. All right. Um, with that underway, um, out of the way, um, please, Tom, you can start with your um, experiences with uh, installing Linux Mint on your laptop. Okay, now let's get started. I was in Auckland, actually uh, Albany, and uh, there is a huge JB hardware shop. So I asked them uh, what sort of laptop they could recommend for Linux. They only heard the first bit and showed me a wonderful $3,200 machine. When I asked them, now, uh, would it take Linux? They said, of course. And I said, okay, that's easy to prove. Just uh, show me what you need to do. The answer was uh, pretty prompt. We can't do that because they're all in demo mode. And if we leave demo mode, you know, we can't write to the hard disk, then there is no warranty anymore. So I said, oh, that's very strange. Okay, let's try the next JB Hardware. JB Hardware in town in Auckland in Queen Street. Asked one of the guys, can you show me a decent laptop that would run Linux? I said, yeah, we've got plenty. Now this one was close to $4,000. And uh, I had my uh, Linux memory stick and told them, oh, well, this is going to be my day. Let's just prove that it can load Linux. And I said, hey, of course it will, will do that. But it didn't do a thing. <laughs> so I had to leave again and uh, tried the same in Hamilton, J.B. Hamilton. They had one guy left in the technical department who said, uh, it might work, but uh, give us some time. And he checked all the required uh, support stuff that was needed for Linux and said, it will work. But I'm on my own here, so it will take at least three weeks or even three months to get it done. I didn't want to wait that long, so I had to give this man a miss. One final uh, try in Cambridge, and in Cambridge, well, there was no leaving actually, they said, yes, it's going to work. So I said, that's no problem. Got my Visa card out, one hand, the other hand held the memory stick. And just before I put my Visa card in the machine, I said, well, let's just see if it boots properly from that memory stick. It was Mint, uh, it was Mint 20. And it didn't. So we tried several times, and I didn't stick my Visa card in the machine. But the man who had told me all these things had suddenly disappeared. So after a while, I thought, well, there's only one way to find out. Let's go to Rotorua, where everything is possible, because they had lots and lots of second-hand computers there. I found one in the center of town, Tutanika Street, and the guy said, uh, we can do that on a used second-hand Hewlett Packard machine. Come and pick it up, and it will be $450. So that's what I did, put my stick in there, booted straight away, installed it. All I had to do is get a new battery, 
because the old battery was only doing one hour. But uh, here at Packet uh, laptops have got huge batteries, and it would be a piece of cake for people to refresh them or redo them. And now I'm using a wonderful unit packet machine, solid steel, pretty heavy. You could probably use it to uh, nail some stuff, and uh, it just works. It's got a wonderful BIOS built in. And it has got, for some reason, a DVD writer. Not that I had any use for that, but it's built in. So the machine is good, and it does exactly what I wanted it to do. No demo mode, no shilly-shallying about the windows and things. It runs Mint 20 without a problem. So I'm very lucky I got there. But uh, there would be some dealers in the area that are not too happy. But on the other hand, uh, they believe in Microsoft. And if Microsoft tells them that green is yellow, then they believe green is yellow. I didn't. Did you get all that? Yes, thank you. Um, do you want to show us a little bit what your desktop looks like and um, what applications are there, what versions there are, for instance, LibreOffice and whatnot? Uh, I've put uh, everything on it. I had on an old Toshiba first, and uh, it's basically it's only what comes uh, with, uh, uh, with Mint 20. So LibreOffice is there. I've put uh, Latex on it because uh, I've written quite a few articles, and everything works perfectly. Uh, I have got an old version of, uh, you know, a movie maker there, and even that works. So, uh, yeah, uh, I can't argue with that. It's perfect. So, Lawrence wants to know what the name of the shop was in Rotorua. Uh, I don't remember the name, but it is in Tutanikai Street. The name Tutanikai rings a bell, doesn't it? It was the guy who was living on Mokoa Island. And Tutanikai Street is pretty much in the centre. Uh, just look it up in uh, Google. Uh, they have got two people there. I think uh, they're Turks or whatever. But is they that, know their job, and they've got lots and lots of uh, second-hand machines. Is it uh, PC Hut? That. Pardon? PC Hut? That could be the name. Tutanikai Street. Um, well, this, Tutanikai. Yeah, they are. Yeah. They didn't really want to uh, get into a new battery, but then uh, you wouldn't believe it. Even the small town of Putaru had connections to a guy in Tokoroa who said, yeah, I know how to uh, refresh or redo these huge batteries. Not the small ones, they don't do that. But uh, the big battery uh, took about two weeks and $180 to get a battery that lasts and lasts and lasts now. Mm. Cool. Um, since you're sharing your screen, do you want to show us sort of like what the menu looks like and uh, pop up some applications that you've installed? Uh, Peter, there is no menu because I've run uh, Mint 20 from the command line. So there's only a command line there and uh, no. I, could, I could pop up anything. Uh, yeah, the command line will do you you just clicked earlier on the sound config so if you click on the linux mint start button again okay i'll do that did it come yeah. across yeah yeah uh it's fairly ordinary stuff you know audacity yeah. i i installed audacity because i needed mm -hmm. something for that then uh Bluetooth. Bluetooth works well. Mm -hmm. um, what's special? No, there's hardly anything special. What's uh, the version of LibreOffice that you're using on there? You want to start up LibreOffice Writer? 
Yeah, I, I picked the latest one. Yeah, the but what's one. the current version there? Um, have to look Start at that. Start it up. Start it up. Yep. Um, okay, so, oh, well, let's fire up LibreOffice. No, not there, please. No, 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 uh, no, no. You're in the browser. Uh, not there. In the browser. Okay. Not in the browser. In the command okay. line? No, no, no. Click on the start menu again. No. Okay. Yep. Start menu. Ah, office. Yeah, yep. got it. That one. Yep. And then start up writer, LibreOffice writer on the right hand side. Uh, so, LibreOffice. Yep, that'll do. And it's there. Can you see it? Yep. And go on the in the menu, go on help. Yep. Oops. No, no, no. Yep. Help. In the menu on top top bar, sorry. Mm -hmm. Not that one. Um six point four. Right. Uh you have to hand it to uh the mint people. There are plenty of updates. They can really keep you up to date. And uh okay, I've had them a long time for a very long time and uh yeah nothing wrong with that mm -hmm. just, so just in the microphone window let's get out of it again i think i have to get back into yeah yeah, yeah back in. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just minimize this window yep yeah. I'm back in there. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. What movie maker are you using? Movie maker. Yeah. Uh, that's the old story. I couldn't really uh, find a decent version. I was happy with, so I had a uh, port movie, the good old movie maker, and uh, that runs perfectly under Ubuntu. Mm. So what I did is I put uh, that on a memory stick and run it in in uh, Mint. So that makes movies, and then once everything's done, I play them back in Mint. Mint mm. hasn't got a decent movie maker. It's all very, very crazy, but modern. Yeah. Mm. And the latest movie makers are actually in memory only. And that's not what I'm after. I want to sort of uh, record it. Mm. Uh, nothing wrong with old Ubuntu. Uh, I don't use anything else there, but uh, I want to use or I want to keep using the good old uh, movie maker there. Mm. Um, so I've recently used PTV um, for creating some screencasts for, for work. And that was work, working out actually all right. So it was really simple. I was uh, using Open Broadcast Studio to record basically um, the session or what I was doing on the screen and then use PTV basically to trim the video and then adding a just an image, a PNG image as a start screen sort of like yeah. in there. And then render the video. That was really, really easy in PTV. That sort of like it used to be OpenShot what I used, but I switched to PTV because it crashes a lot less. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, OpenShot is still okay because uh, I take uh, or take a lot of photos and movies using a GoPro camera and mm -hmm. the MP4s. Uh, I'll just take them together, stitch them together, or mm. uh, add things to it. But uh, the GoPro is on the way out because it can't get batteries for it anymore. And the oh, next right. GoPro is terribly expensive and doesn't <laughs> do ordinary MP4. It does all sorts of things you neither want nor need. Mm. So uh, I'll have to go to the shop and get a Samsung Z flip, flip camera. All right. That's a camera and it does MP4 and it's a phone and it does music and it's a mini computer mm, it's just yeah. expensive yeah um ian has a question 
Um, do you yep. know how much RAM your laptop has? Uh, I remember from memory, it's six gigabytes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, the RAM storage is 256. The storage is 256. Yeah. It hasn't, yeah. hasn't got a real disk. No. SSD, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, it's a nice, nice, fast machine, but then, mm. uh, you know, uh, Hewlett Packard have been making things for ages, so they, they don't cut corners. You know? mm. The Toshima had one snag. After 11 years, the second battery died, and there was no replacement. And the Toshiba laptop didn't really have a battery you could take out like that. You had to mm. open uh, screws, and then it came on a whole uh, board, little bits and pieces. And to get into it, you had to get a Torx screwdriver, uh, <laughs> which I had. <laughs> You're not supposed to have them. And then uh, I did that twice, and the second battery gave up after yeah after another five years so mm. no replacement nothing at all it still lives uh, but only on power yeah but 11 years is pretty good for a laptop yeah i was told that uh, they should all die after 11 years but um <laughs> okay, it's it's not totally dead it just needs power so yeah. uh, all i have to do is uh, carry or well, carry a, a battery with me yeah or something mm. to generate uh, input here. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Cool. Awesome. But it's okay. Uh, Toshiba uh, did well, but they're out of the race, and uh, Hewlett Packard mm. uh, are still very much in the race. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, any other okay. questions? You're welcome. Yeah. So I'll just listen to uh, the next uh, presentation. Yep. All right, Ian. I'll make you then presenter. Okay, I'll just. Um, hello, yes, I'm presenter. I'll just um, shrink this, minimise that, and launch that. What's this in the background? I mean, get rid of that. Hmm. Okay. Can you, um, yeah, you can hear me okay, Peter, right? Yes, I can, yeah. Yep. Okay, well, we're not, okay. Well, I've I'll got your, the sound coming up on the speakers here, so you can just yep. talk over me whenever you want. And, uh, okay, I'll mute myself, though, for the time being. Okay. Um, yep. The, the only thing that could happen is I, I've got a couple of times when I go to the web to show web, uh, so I, my audio might crunch when I run out of CPU. Yeah, um, we'll see. We'll just go with the flow. We'll Thanks. see how it goes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, right, well, recently um, I installed uh, Ubuntu 2204. So this is a little presentation about my experiences with, with doing that. Um, and I never did the contents page. So just to um, some details about the latest release. It came out on the 21st of April this uh, year. Um, it's 2204. It's a long-term uh, support release. Uh, its code name is Jamie Jellyfish, and uh, platforms it runs on are uh, uh, Intel 64, um, the ARM, so like uh, Raspberry Pi 4s, RISC 5 which should interest Mike, shouldn't it? Have you got a risk five laptop? Um, and then there's the um, Power PC. I think it's got to start at something like Power 8 or something. And IBM and RMHF is the... Yeah, older. Yeah, I think oh, anyway, older ARM, um, like older Raspberry Pis. Oh, because, so in addition to ARM64, so there's still a 32 platform in there. Yeah, uh-huh. Oh. And the kernel it's based on is um, 5.15, which is relatively new. I think we're at 5.17 or something. Um, yeah, and it's it's really um, built off Debian 11, I think, which is called Bullseye. Um, but that would be the Debian 11 unstable, wouldn't it? It's built off. That's, that's stable. That's, that's oh. stable. Oh, that's kind of stable. Okay. Um, by, the, by default, 
they uh, produce a desktop which is uh, uses known um, graphics and uh, they produce a server version, uh, an Internet of Things version, and um, a, a cloud uh, so, uh, version. And then they have flavors of desktops that are available. So you've got the Kubuntu, which is KDE, Alex, 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 the Kylan is the Chinese one. Mate is the one that I've been using for quite a few years and I default to. Studio is um, one that's all packaged with all the audio bits and pieces. And um, Xubuntu is the X, oopsie, sorry, XFCE. XFCE. Um, yeah, okay. And, okay, that's the website. I won't go to that at the moment. Um, it's got support for the next five years. And um, quick question, Ian. Are you showing something? Because I can see only one slide, the starting slide. Oh, it didn't change slides. Oh dear. No, it's only the first slide that I see. <laughs> yeah. So now that I've come out of that, you can see the slide I'm talking about? No. Can you see my slideshow? I the, um, did the you share your screen? Hmm. I think I might have to go back to doing... Um, because what I can see is the presentation that you uploaded. Which one? Oh, okay. All right, maybe now. Um, that must have been in the buffer or something, wasn't it? How about, can you see that? Mm, no. Are you sharing your screen? I think. Uh, the middle four icons, right here, that one. Right, okay. So, screen one, I'll do the whole screen, right? Yeah, I can just do the Ubuntu presentation. I thought just do the screen, that's easier. All right. Because otherwise, you have to select the right. Okay, so now if I shrink that, can you see the. Um, oh, the yes. Yes. Right, <laughs> start from slideshow. Yep, that's Is okay. That cool. Yep. Okay, cool. So that was what I was talking about. I was just going down this list. Um, oh, right, yeah. Five years general support on, on this latest release. And, uh, and then there's another five years what they call security support where they offer patches. Um, the packaging format is um, Debian. And for package managers, there's the APT, Advanced Package Tool, and um, Ubuntu software. Is that Snaps? I yeah, Snaps is there as well, but um, oh, I, 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 <laughs> I don't really use it. Snaps is sort of automatic or something, isn't it? It's, um, it's this great big self-contained downloads with all the dependencies and yeah. Yeah. Okay, I haven't, I haven't got into that yet. Canonical is very big on them. I think yeah, I think, they, I think they invented it, didn't they? Isn't that their little uh, loop where how they lock people in? Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, developers uh, canonical, and um, yeah, there's some release notes here. I'll just see what happens when I click on that. I should be online. Yes. Um, so how about a, a discourse.ubuntu.com with various things in it? And um, this will bring up the release notes. Has my microphone gone bad or you can still hear me, Peter? It's starting to struggle again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, the model is of, of what's, what's new with, um, and what, what's been upgraded. So, um, do you look at that link to see what, what the story is there? Okay, I'll, yeah, my fans just started speeding up, so it must, <laughs> must, must have been a bit much. Yes, scrolling on the screen is not good. <laughs> You're saying, can you hear me okay now? Yep, it's good again. Okay. Um, so just with regard to the, the history of um, Ubuntu, 
the first release was um, in 2004, October, and so we have um, uh, version numbering scheme is uh, the year, um, or the units of the year, and then the month. Um, so that's 17 years ago. Um, the long-term support releases every two years, with interim releases every six months. And then uh, a long-term support release is likely to have um, five or more point releases. Um, the initial release is like point zero or dot zero, but they don't actually call it that. Um, it's not till dot one comes along that they, uh, they start having the numbering of the point releases. Um, they're about every six months. So if you look at something like um, 2004, then it's up, uh, it came out two years ago, then it's up to dot five, which is its, uh, dot four, which is its um, fifth release. So it's about every six months. Hey, uh, the intelligence that it's been exactly every six months, April or October, yeah. except one year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One year, they've only done this year. Yeah. So. Well, they knew about it, I think, yeah. Um, so totally they've had 36 releases in, uh, of um, interim, well, 36 six monthly releases, nine of those are uh, LTS releases. And um, Mark Shuttleworth was the CEO and he set up uh, Canonical and uh, he, he relinquished that role for a while, but I think he's back being the CEO. And um, he, he created the Ubuntu Foundation and Ubuntu is currently funded by Canonical Limited. Okay. Here, here's the release time frame and um, they are pretty... Um, 6 or 6, that was one I mean. 6 or 6, not 6 or 4. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's two months late with this one. These ones, 4, 10, 5, 4. 5, 10, should be 6, 0, 4. So then 6, 10. They, they did announce about a month in advance that they would be late with um, that one. But otherwise, they... Um, they, they are sort of guaranteed to release on schedule. Um, although, if looking at uh, the Wikipedia on uh, on, on uh, this release, um, it, it, it sort of said um, reviews that have been done by certain people, and and one of the reviewers, two of them were positive, and one of the reviews was a bit negative. The third one. And, 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 and the reviewer said, it seems like the only thing they're interested in doing is just releasing on schedule. <laughs> that, that the problem itself <laughs> didn't really matter. Um, which I thought was a bit unfair. But, uh, I think it's a, a sign of good project management to be able to maintain the schedule like that and be able to release within the month. You know, Microsoft could learn a lesson or two there. Um, this this chart also so up the very top here shows the 2204 release coming out uh, in April, and the orange is the um, five years of support it has, and then the dark brown is the uh, extended security maintenance. Along the bottom here, I don't know whether that shows up, but you've got Debian 3.1, uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So we're in the 11 bracket for when. 2204 was released, and um, the Linux. Are you seeing my mouse pointer, Peter? Yeah. Yes, I do. Thank you. Oh, okay, that's good. Yeah, and the Linux kernel. We're up to 5.10 came out about here, so we're, we're a bit beyond that. Okay, so that's sort of uh, the history of them. Um, when you, if you decide you want. To, Put in Ubuntu, you'll need to download an image, so there's um, a download uh, site. And uh, one of the things I found is that rather than download from Ubuntu.com, you can download from a mirror site. And, and one of those is the free software, uh, FSMG, what would it be? Free software mirroring, mirror something, <laughs> um, which has the Ubuntu releases. And it's um, it's at 20 gigabits per second, so you get a fairly sort of slick download from there. And um, interestingly enough, this FSMG, we'll just go, we'll go and have a, we'll try, I'll, I'll try this and see what happens. Yeah, it's a 
So this is the site of Mary Group, and um, it seems that the high capacity, high speed network to New Zealand's top researchers and educators. So they provide two data centres, one's in Hamilton and one's in Christchurch, I think, wasn't it? So, um, so it should be pretty slick because it's kind of not the data centre in Hamilton if you go to download it. And, um, yeah, but if you cruise through it, you'll probably find the parking lot quite often. You can look at those statistics. So they, um, here's the Hamilton mirror. Uh, um, so I wonder whether it's at Wigan University. Is that the way I want the mirror? Yeah. The WANs is the network that the universities use in New Zealand. So they're all connected via RIANs. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, sponsors, mirrors, contact statistics. Um, anyway, that's a bit of a additional bandwidth graphs here. I'm going to do a diagram of the network. Uh, <laughs> that must be the international code for Hamilton, though, is it? Uh, I, think, I don't think we are important in the Okay. I remember they chose it. Yeah. Um, I just, somewhere here, it will actually show the network, which is, I thought it was quite intriguing. Um, Data privacy documentation. Yeah. Just, I know it's about, maybe it's about. Yeah. 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 Uh, anyway, that was just a distraction. I'll, I'll get back to my. Yeah, that, these are the different things that they mirror. Yeah. Uh, CentOS. I thought CentOS had gone. Yeah. They, they should have Rocky or something, shouldn't they? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's announcement. It's still only like a year or so. Anyway, that, that's. Um, that was just a little by the by. Um, yeah, so you can download it as an ISO or a torrent, and, um, and then having got the image, um, you need to have a, a laptop or, or a server that can handle um, uh, the, the, has the minimum requirements for running. Um, if you can run the, a desktop uh, flavor, then they suggested a dual core process of two gigahertz, four gigs of RAM, and no, about yeah, twenty five gigs or more of this space. You can run on less than that, but it's just how much data you want to put. Um, a server that sort of suggests you could use a real Raspberry Pi as some kind of tame little server. Back in the nineteen nineties, the idea that a server would be less than a desktop. <laughs> well, it's a kind of good yeah, yeah. Um, this is, well, there is release notes if you want to see more, but um, uh, I'm not sure this was somebody's version of the features. Best suited for enterprise class deployments. I, I, I think he was talking about the server at that stage. Um, can, can be installed to run on all major architects, and they quote these ones, okay, which I quoted before. Uh, long term kernel. I don't, um, the kernel will start off at say 15, 5.15.1, but in two years' time it might be 5.15.20, right? So it'll stay, the 5.15 stays with this release, but the, the, the point versions that come after that. Yeah. Um, so it's got SSL 3.0, um, you know. I guess that's fair up to date. Python 3.10. That's, that's the current stable or the. Is that? 3.10.1. Okay. Yeah. So that's the current yeah. stable. Okay. Um, it doesn't say there, but if you, if you bring in the integrated repository with Python and you load the GTK, 
then it only supports GTK3. It, it doesn't have GTK4 yet, which which I thought was a bit strange because around January this year I, I downloaded the latest um, Manjaro and it had GTK4 in, in there. So, so some things are up to date, but uh, if, they, if you miss something like that, then theoretically you wait two years before <laughs> GTK4 comes along, you know. Uh, it's not, not all that great. MySQL, because they mentioned MariaDB as an option. Oh. Because you know that um, MariaDB has port, the code. Yeah. And MariaDB is not like Ring 10 or something. Okay. And sometimes I run MySQL 8 or so, it's no longer interchangeable. Oh, okay. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, I might have to just test. Can we test that something? We'll see what, which one wants to load or something. Um, okay, once you've got the image downloaded to the machine you've got at the moment, and um, then you need to um, take it out to a USB stick. So you can use the, um, use the DB method, and um, uh, it pays to put, what's this, um, the, yeah, larger block size, and this progress, status equals progress, will give you a little uh, gas gauge as it's doing the copying and uh, and sync, I think, is to make sure it flushes everything at the end, doesn't it? But that's what the file, so you're not being a file copy, why do you need to do a sync? Oh, I don't know, I just copied someone's command. Okay. But I, I thought it was um, if you ran out of space or something. Sync is for copying the file system cache. Yeah. So this is, this is not doing the file system at all. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, right. well, because I've seen that command without the sync, and I've seen it with the sync. Yeah, yeah I don't think so. You need that sync. I mean, that it flushes automatically when you do DD. Yeah. There's no caching. There's no caching the sector rights. Yeah. I, th yeah. I think when you when I used to look at the installing Raspbian image to to those little um, SD cards, I think that's where I used to see that put a sync on the end. I, I don't think they put and on sync, they just put sync. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and and only do that if the previous one was successful. Yeah, okay. Which is, yeah, I mean, very yeah. possibly somebody stuck it in because they do it on all their copies. Yeah. Copy Whoops. Oh, sorry. Um, there was that a good called Mac Startup Disk, which is um, you put in your little SSD and it will, um, it will copy. Um, the ISO file to an SSD, and uh, I guess this is where I copied that thing from. Have you heard of Ventoy? Who? Ventoy. Hmm. It, it lets you put a bunch of images on a USB stick and then choose which one you want to boot. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. So there was a thing What's called it called again? V E N T O Y, Ventoy. Oh, okay. Can you put it in the chat, Ian? Mm. Oh. Hey, right. I think it's called that, yeah. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, you cool. just, yeah, you just put all your image files onto the USB stick, boot that stick, and then let you choose. V-E-N-T-O-Y. V-E-N-T-O-Y. All one word, one word. Oh. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a little... Uh, Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Peter, are you Googling it? Yeah, I am. Many images on one USB. Oh, there's some more. Is that one? I put it on the link. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, cool, thanks. Father, did you find it? Ventoy.net. Okay. Is that the Bootable USB drives for 
Oh, okay. So you can put as many as you want and it shows you how many. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, back to the story. I will, um, slide you. Okay. Oh, no, an upgrade. Um, yeah. One of the things is when, when they come out with the, what I call the dot zero or the initial release, there is no um, online upgrade at, at that time, and um, uh, you have to wait for 22.04.1 to be released, in, in which case um, you'll start to get prompted if you're still running a system running um, 22 the 20.04 or 21.10. Or a two-year-old system or a six-month-old system, then we'll start to get prompted to say, "Do you want to upgrade to 22.04?" Okay, and um, uh, some, it's normally about now. I was actually hoping it might have happened before tonight, so I, I could have um, tried out doing the online upgrade. But um, I know with 22, going back two years, uh, with 20.04. It was uh, 8th of August, so 2004 was released in April, so that's April, May, June, July. It's uh, three months before um, before they had all the bugs out of um, 2004 and, and they were um, happy to, to do a uh, online upgrade. Um, I might add that when you put in 2204, I think there's about 500 megabytes of patches. <laughs> it goes, uh, upgrades, you know, updates you do. Um, one of the reasons why I like the online upgrade is that um, there's minimal intervention or well, there was last two years ago. It, when you'd start the online upgrade, it asks for the password, it might ask you to confirm proceeding to the online upgrade and then it, it went ahead and did it and um, at the end it just said, uh, I've finished, do you want to reboot? And um, and that's what I like, particularly if you're doing, say, 20. Then you can start 20 and go away for lunch and come back and uh, and, and reboot all 20 and they all come up, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to see it, oops, compared with Microsoft, as to if you had 20 Microsoft systems and you tried to take them from Windows 10 to Windows 11 or something, whether you could, could do it in an hour or less. Um, Patch due dates of multi-gigabytes already, isn't it? Sorry? Each, each monthly patch update is gigabytes of Windows, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. I haven't used Windows for years, yeah. Who's that? Uh, 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 Microsoft did a, a blog post. Mm -hmm. uh, their own research showed that a Windows machine needs to be typically take up to eight hours download the necessary patches each time. Mm -hmm. And it needs a minimum of two hours continuous just to get started. <laughs> I think probably why, why so many Windows machines don't get a properly patch. Oh, okay. Yeah. You've got to leave it on for two hours while it negotiates with all those sizes or something. Get, gets all the details. Yeah. Okay. In a few good. years, it'll take you more downtime with updates than actually being productive. Basically, eight hours. Yeah. That's every month. How many yeah. months have you got in a month? You've got about 20 odd work days in a month. Mm -hmm. That's a whole work day. That's 5% yeah. from a day. Well, I, my colleague occasionally sort of like has these forced reboots to install updates. Yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing he can do, and then he just sits there and twiddles his thumbs. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, to carry on. What's I mentioned that example before that, um, that once um, the point release, point one, comes out, then every six months or so there's point two, point three, which is really a consolidation of all the patches. So that if you, in, in a year's time, you'd probably load, download 2204.3. And when you go to, once you're finished, when you go to do the updates, you might only have 100 megs or something like that of updates on it. Whereas if you loaded, downloaded, 22.04.0, um, you might have a gig or something of up upgrades. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but 
for, for if, if this was replaced with instead of saying focal uh, focal fossa, which was uh, 2004 uh, release, um, in this this is in this discourse that that's where they'll 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 have the status of of when the 22.04.1 will come out, and if there's anything, um, uh, what do they call it? Um, oh. And something cliffhanger, no, gate, uh, a gating issue, you know, like it. Uh, 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 something block it, release block it. Yeah, yeah. So, so there were two things that were blocking this last release, and then eventually it, it turned to released. You know, so, so if, if it goes on for maybe another month, then there'll probably be a jelly. Uh, what was it Jamie Jellyfish twenty two dollar four dot one point release status tracking, you know, uh, will come up. Yeah. Okay, so let's move. Oh, and um, at this point we take a little break and switch slideshows, um, which I think I've got. The tip I had up, this, what we're going to look at now is um, uh, Um, installing a, a, um, a desktop, doing a desktop installation, and then I'll, I'll show you the slides of doing a, um, a server installation. So, um, you've, um, based on your PC firmware, you, you'll get a boot menu, and you plug in your USB stick, and you, you should see on the USB stick that you've got a choice of, of either booting the Ubuntu image on the USB stick in, in UEFI mode or booting it in legacy mode. Okay, so both versions should appear there. Um, it seems like the way to go really is UEFI and try and avoid legacy mode. Um, once you've, you've booted it, the grub menu will come in and um, try and install Ubuntu and then um, it, that brings in the next stage uh, where you I would, I would suggest you try Ubuntu first and, and just make sure that, so you can play a, a YouTube clip, so that would test that your Wi-Fi works, that your audio works, that the video replay works, that sort of thing. Um, so anyway, if you, it doesn't matter which one you choose. Um, if you try Ubuntu, then you get the choice later on to um, install it. Um, if you proceed with installation, then um, first question is the keyboard. So uh, we, we normally use in New Zealand the US English. Um, now, updates, um, if you click normal, then it will put in things like um, little office and stuff. You can have a minimal installation <coughs> and um, with just a web browser and basic utilities. and. Um, I normally don't do updates while installing the bunker, I reckon, although it, um, it claims to save time. This saves time after installation, yeah, but the whole process takes longer. <laughs> so I reckon you're better off to just do the install without the updates and then do the updates afterwards and you'll finish quicker. Um, it, I, I didn't select install third party software for graphics and Wi Fi hardware. Um, but I didn't need to. It, everything worked. Um, but one time I clicked on that and then it asked, depends on the BIOS, I think, of your system, but I was doing a UEFI install and it, it, it then wanted a password. And it, it forced me to have a password on the, on the BIOS, right? Because it said, I don't know, third party software must be password protected, I suppose. I, I, I don't know. But um, I thought it was a bit strange. Uh, um, so, although it's, you normally think, oh, you know, I'll click on the third party software, you may not need it. You know, um, the, the, the open source software that, that's provided works. I also tried this twice. I, I, or in I, mail. Pardon? Who is calling me? Tom? It's not us. We're not calling you. Yeah. Are you there, Peter? 
I just muted Tom. I think he may have gotten a phone call. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. um, I, I tried two installs, and I did one install without this checked, and then I did another one with it checked. But at the end of them, I just went into the root directory, and I did an ls minus r, um, and output put it, well, my little ls minus l, capital R, and, and output it to a, to a file. And then I, I just counted how many lines were in the file. And there were more lines, <laughs> lines in the file where I, I, I hadn't checked it. Because I was thinking, oh, I'll, I'll look through the files and find out what ones get added when you click on install third party software. But for some reason, there were less files. Uh, um, I've got the files here if you want to look later. <laughs> I, I couldn't work that out. Okay, um, installation type, well, yeah, arrays disk and install Ubuntu. If you do that, it doesn't actually create a swap file. Uh, I don't know, it, it puts the swap as a file inside the edge. Yeah. yeah, rather than a partition. Otherwise, quite often I click on something else so that I can sort of see what's going on. Um, so uh, if you click on something else, one option might be you want to have an EFI partition, a swap area, your main uh, boot ext4 partition. Uh, that's more if you're going for uh, LVM or disk encryption, right? Uh, and then uh, your main ext4 mounted at slash being where Ubuntu will mostly reside and where your data would reside. Um, yeah, you might want a home partition to put your data in rather than put it over to OS. Yeah, I would really recommend having a home partition because then you can just wipe your OS and then just remount your home without having mm -hmm. to copy stuff. And also, Peter, have multiple OS partitions. Leave the rest unused. Oh, that, yes, yes, yeah. yeah. But I usually need all the spies, so I usually have a certain amount for the OS and then the rest is just home. Uh -huh. If you have a terabyte drive, yeah. sometimes 60 gig OS partitions is nothing really. Mm. Yeah, and the second hand laptop said I have, uh, I don't have a terabyte SSD in there. <laughs> okay, not necessarily. Yeah, okay. My, my laptop, you see, my, it came with a 256 SSD, but yeah. also a terabyte hard drive because I knew I needed to. All right, yeah. Um, okay. What well, well, this just shows creating, um, I don't know, it wasn't me, it was I just some, I found this, but um, um, notice how they're all, he's creating the petitions for um, the boot and the EFI system and uh, the EXT4 petition and the swap area. Each one he's making it a primary position, okay, which he can do because he's got um, G global petitioning, yeah, global petitioning tables. and. Um, when you've created the petitions, then uh, it, 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 these little windows that I've got here, that this fifth window, fifth presentation, shows you know that first bit of the disk is being um, uh, EFI, and then the next bit is uh, swap, and then the next bit is EXT4, and yeah, I think it's it. There was another K in there somewhere. I think he's truncated it. Anyway, so we did a, a, a look at uh, how things are, are going to be created on the disk. Um, this was from the Ubuntu handbook. It, it suggested different ways of um, creating a, a system. So EFI plus EXT4 mounted at slash, and um, this, this one with the ex, uh, a separate swap file. Um, I think that's how I normally, the second one is how I normally do things. Oh, plus the home. You know, we have suggest having a home petition. Um, and then from here down, these are legacy boot only, was the, was the suggestion. Yeah. Except the bottom one I see, the reason for separating out slash boot is because it can't be encrypted. Right, yeah. If you want to encrypt the room, you've got to have a separate slash boot. Yeah. Obviously. Um, yeah, I, I haven't done that either, but um, at least one time I, I, I fiddled around with doing encryption once. But, uh, in fact, I'm not even sure where we're at, or where Ubuntu's at with encryption, which 
type of encryption defaults to these days. I thought we could look that up. I, I thought it added years ago, you know, full, full disk encryption, I mean. I thought that was added years ago. That's why, that's why you had that last option. Well, added to the kernel? Um, no, Linux kernel. Uh, whatever support is needed, I think it's a disco issue. No, I don't think the kernel. Yeah, because at one stage they were using one type. But when I looked at it a few years back, they were using some type of encryption. And then there were comments saying, oh, no, don't use that. Wait, wait six months or something because everything's switching over to doing this or something. Yeah. So but I never kind of went back to that. Okay, moving on. Um, oh, this guy did do an encrypted position. And so he's got to put in keys and uh, recovery keys and remember them and write them down somewhere. And that's why I never do encrypted. <laughs> Okay, so he did that, and um, uh, then having done it, this is how his encrypted disks look. He has to um, force that one to have a mount point by the looks, and then he's right. Um, and one other screen you asked is um, is like you've got to create your your priv account. So um, uh, so. When you've finished doing the install, there's one account created. And you can either log in automatically or, or use your password to log in. Okay, and oh, then time zone you've got to fill in. And then um, it'll run a little slideshow where it copies um, all the files uh, to your hard disk. And at the end of it, it'll be prompted and then uh, you will reboot. I remove the USB stick and then when it comes back up, run an update and an upgrade and then reboot again and that's basically finished. First yet, uh, install. And then just looking at a server installation, um, from the firmware menu, yeah, boot the USB stick with the USB server image. Okay, and this is where I flag these sides from. Um, so again, it comes up with grub. And then you pick the English language keyboard. Um, well, you do there anyway. Done. And you say you want to be a Ubuntu server uh, or minimised. Um, it, it forces you to have a network connection. Um, yeah, to, to to actually do the install. Whereas you can get away with no network connection for the desktop. But um, I think. It, yeah, I don't think it will allow you to do it without having a network connection. Uh, you've got an you option to put a proxy address. Um, you can have your mirror address for where it will get its updates from and things. Um, yeah, how you want to set up your um, storage. So, oh, this guy is setting it up as an uh, LVM use entire disk, okay, and so this is a summary of how he's setting up his, um, uh, his disk, and destructive action, okay, so um, that's confirming to, to write it in the disk, then it wants to count details once again, and um, uh, prompting you whether or not to have this as an open SSH server, which I probably you do want to have that, I guess. Um, and yeah, this is one of the things. This is the snap things you're talking about, right? These are popular snaps in server environments. Select or deselect with space, press enter, and see more detail. Okay, and um, so I'm not sure which of these. So no, You can have PowerShell. I thought that was. Yep, PowerShell. <laughs> Complete with curl and wget commands. So okay. Um, one of the things like Heroku, I've got a Heroku account, um, and I, uh, which is a web, basically a website, Heroku.com, I think. And but it's kind of a weird. You can you can have the website like I might put a make create a socket server on this website. Yeah. I've got but. I can't really, I can't look at how to get in and, and see it. You just sort of upload it and it works or it doesn't. Yeah. But you can't actually sort of log into the server and 
see your application there and, and whatever. Yeah, I can let you have a play and if, if you can make more sense out of it, you're welcome. Is there so, an API? One lady one, an API. Yeah, well, you know, with, oh, I haven't actually done it on this computer, but um, you, you can down, you know, just under APT install, you can put in uh, Heroku client or something like that, and that gives you a um, command line interface into the Heroku website. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, um, but look, that's, you know that I told you about that little game where the HTTP server was in Python anywhere, and, and on Heroku I had the WebSocket server oh, okay. doing the game logic. Oh, okay. and, and, and yeah, and that, okay. so it worked. I mean, it's, I think it still works. So. Anyway, if there's anything there that excites you, that's um, Snaps. And I think the Snaps, they do auto updates, don't they? Uh, snaps will do automatic updates or something. You know, you don't have to. Um, well, I think isn't that how like these days with uh, Mozilla Firefox, it does automatic updates in the background, and then you just get a message, you know, restart Firefox to take a new version. And I think that's done through Snaps. That was my. Uh, on, on Debian, it's, it's a proper package, so they probably disable all that. Uh, so it has to be done through the normal packing system. Yeah. Well, I mean, these days for Firefox, I'm just working away, and every now and then it'll message, sorry, every week or two weeks it says, Firefox has just been updated, you know, reboot now to, to take a new version. And close all the Firefox windows close, and then open again, and you know, you haven't, it hasn't lost, well, so far it hasn't lost anything. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so then it does the install until you finally get installation complete and it wants you to do a reboot. So that's just, a look, I think, the last bit of the, the log file. Much, much less snazzy looking than the desktop install. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is more serious. <laughs> less fun to look at. Uh, well, one of the things that's missing from it is I th pretty sure the uh, Maybe going back to 1804 of the server, it had um, task select, T A S K S E L. Yeah, and um, and that used to one of the screens was the task select screen, and it was sort of like, what other bits and pieces do you want to add? Yeah. Uh, a server role. <laughs> so web server, okay. Do you want Apache? Do you want PHP? Do mm. you want uh, uh, DNS? Okay, you want. Yeah, but one of the th yeah, so so that but I, I assume we can still install task select and, and use that as a, a, a simple way of, of doing the installs. But yeah, um, no, I did with 2004 server. Yeah, I, I, I went and installed task select, and one of the things you can do with um, task select is you can put in um, you can add a desktop, so you can add Mate desktop. Uh, to your server, okay? But by default, it will boot up and you will log in and with, you know, log in and password uh, at, at command level, and then you will type start x to... to oh, okay. To, 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 yeah. yeah. So you can, you can log in with your console and, and you can work away as, as a, just the command line level, and then if you do want to do something using... Um, or GUI, then you can just start X and your GUI starts running. Yeah. And, uh, and you can actually, um, yeah, you know, right, if you don't like it, you can remove you know, Mate or whatever and, um, <laughs> and you don't need it. Basically, once you log out from the GUI, you're back at your command line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you set it up under Sys Control, and I think you set up, is it something like multi version or something? Multi, uh, I can find it for you. There's, there's, a, there's a switch there in the, um, at the command line. So what is the default when the system boots? Does it boot right up into GUI mode or does it boot and just stop at the um, command line? Yeah. In, in the old days, that's how you got it in X. Yeah. Later on, it's called a display manager. The thing that presents you with the GUI log is called a display manager. That was added later. Uh -huh. um,
And this is just, yeah, it's come up in the guy's login room and he's, um, he must have been, he's using the SSH login, I guess. Anyway, that's, um, oh, yeah. So, uh, one thing it tells you, I think, when you log in, let's see how many updates. 12 updates can be applied immediately. Mm. That sounds too good to be true. I don't <laughs> I think you've already done some, uh, considering how many updates there were for the desktop. Okay, so now we've finished that. Ah. Welcome. <laughs> hey, Angus. Uh, okay, well, um, where are we here? Okay, we'll go back to this first slide, show. You can still hear me? <laughs> if I can hear you. Cool. All right, we're still working. Um, okay. So, uh, so the, the twin two hundred four installation that I did was actually the Marto desktop, and um, once I had booted it up and launched it, I went into the control center, and I don't know whether can you see anything amongst the the different uh, controls for, for setting up your your or configuring your your desktop environment. Is there anything that's missing? Anything that that you'd probably want. It, it normally goes here. So I don't know why it's missing. Yeah, users and groups. <laughs> I don't know why. It's crazy. So if I type user and tab, then I get blah, 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 blah. Right? But I need users admin. Okay? And, and that apparently is in known system tools. So I did an install of known system tools, and it popped in a lot of things. And then after that, I get users admin. And um, now when I go into admin, here I get users and groups. But um, one thing, if I go into it, sure, it shows that I created the initial account I created was called Ian. Um, <coughs> but it doesn't show guest. And, and if, I mean, yeah. I can't actually do a screenshot unless I have a camera or something. But um, uh, it, when you boot up Ubuntu 22.04, and it didn't happen with 20.04 and maybe 18.04, but it used to happen with something like 16.04 or something, that they would default to having a guest account. Anyway, they've gone back to defaulting to have a guest account, but, oops, but, but it doesn't actually show that I expected to see guest here. So it doesn't. Doesn't have that for whatever reason. And this is a transient guest account. So when you reboot, yeah. uh, remember it would actually allocate a new user ID every time you got in. Yeah, the account, you're in the temp folder. Yeah, you, you, you don't see any, any of the users. Yeah, your, your folder is off temp. Yeah, yeah. Um, your own name space yeah. doesn't include the. But, but um, I also, some, somebody has said, well, how do I remove this guest account? Because one of the things is it, you can't, it, you can log into a guest account and if, if you don't like something, you can change it. Like you might change um, something about Firefox. But, but the next time you log out of guest and log back in, Firefox will have gone back to its original parameters. Yeah. Okay, so, so you know, maybe deeper down you can set up how the guest account should look. But, um, Anyway, what I found is if I want to remove the guest account, I can set um, green to allow guest equal false down here. I've done some stuff with like Ian. Yeah. And um, I also tweaked the duck. What I found was when I went to boot the desktop, I didn't get a grub menu. And, um, uh, and sometimes I like to have that, just to you know, pop around. And um, so I, to get it, I just changed the grub's timeout style to menu and I put a grub timeout of three three seconds that will just keep the grub menu before it proceeds. Um, one of the things with UEFI is that OS probe is disabled. Uh, I haven't I think further down on this grub no where is it? Where is it? I think it's UEFI. It Vegan only disabled that recently, a few months ago. And I've been running the UEFI systems for years so Oh, okay. Anyway, that's um, one of the issues. Now, 
I, I had this person bring me a um, probably a laptop from the Times. One was this one was called a um, what was it? Uh, 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 H, HP Pro 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 something or other. Um, oh, anyway. And it's got a, a dot, a M.2 drive in it, which is one of those, it's just like a PC board that plugs into, um, I think this was only 18 mil wide, so it had two fingered. It's got uh, two slots in the fingers, if you get me. The other one's a mini PCI sort of slot, which just has one one notch in the, in the and it's 22 mil wide. These other ones are 18 mil wide. So this one had a little 18 mil 256 gigabyte disk drive. And if we look here, it's using GUID petition table, which is global user ID, I think, is what it stands for. Global, global General. unique, yeah, I think global unique identifier. I think so it's GUID is GUID and they're pretty much the same. Oh, is it? Okay. So looking at her, this lady's disk, it's got a, um, uh, the 105 megabyte here is the EFI. I don't know what the 70 megabytes is. And then here's, I guess, the Windows 255 gigabytes, but it's in BitLocker. And, and, and you can see a little padlock down here. And that's, um, that would be Windows 10 or something and all the data. And then over here, this is a file system petition for. Recovery function? Yeah, I think that's the recovery one. Yeah, okay. But it's in, uh, it's the fact that it's GPT, even though GPT was sort of invented to get over the two terabyte uh, restriction on disks, because the other one, which is the um, M master boot record, is it MBR yeah. petitioning, um, it, it, it couldn't handle about that, but. It looks like these, well, I don't know whether this was the original config from the factory or not, but it looks like, oh yeah, I, I had some other HP systems with um, three and a half inch drives, and I noticed they were GPT, so they've been, it looks like, you know, we're coming out of HP, if they're putting Windows on a, on a drive, even though the drive might be only 500 megabytes, they'll make them GPT. And uh, if you happen to grab a, like this particular laptop had a, a spare space for plugging a standard two and a half inch SSD in. So it would have two, two SSD disk drives. One's the M.2, which is the, just looks like a PC board, and the other one is the little box, like a, like a SATA drive. And um, uh, I put one in, in there and I installed Ubuntu on it and then I got the OS probe to work so it could find the M.2 but I couldn't, I couldn't, at the boot menu I couldn't boot both drives and, and I realised that, that the SSD I put in was an MBR, right, that was its default so when I went and installed Ubuntu on it, it, it put things, it just kept the MBR and put yeah, so I think that was why I had problems. So anyway, you can't mix the partition formats, obviously. Well, yeah, or I, I, I really didn't know, but but it, I, I would think that the, the trick that why well, it's come out of it for me is I'm, yeah, you know, MBR is finished, and I'll just use GPT. And you know the disks utility that comes with, I don't know, come with Debian as well. There's a utility called disks that um, if you. You, 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 it, it's a good utility, and, and um, you can click, and it's set up, and it will format disk. Okay, and um, so if you, you just click on format the disk, and um, it, it will change it to GPT if you happen to have an MBR uh, disk. So, so this was after doing it, changing it to um, uh, go to petition table. Um, yeah, at the beginning here is my UEFI, UEFI system. Then this was my, um, I had 22 gigs I fitted the operating system into. And then this is my um, home petition, and this is my swap petition. Yeah. 
Okay, and yeah, it's GPT. And and now I start looking around. Um, so, oh, I don't know why I'm trying to prove this. Okay, so this is the boot EFI. Hmm. I don't know. I did. Uh, yeah, I think this is me trying to. Um, okay, it was a pro book that uh, they had. Um, EFI boot. Oh, this is Ubuntu. Is that a comma separated values file? CSV. Hmm? CSV. What is that? CSV file? Yeah, good. <laughs> CSV. Uh, um, okay, well, what else? I was playing with tree, trying to do things. Hmm. So, shouldn't is something for the secure boot, isn't it? Yeah, I, I played around. Yeah, and then, then, so that was me looking at the Ubuntu disk, right? And then I tried to see where I can look at the M2 drive, and find because it's encrypted, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I, I guess if I knew the password, <laughs> I, I could get in. But it's, this this lady bought bought it second hand, and I, I told them. Maybe write to the guys that sold it to you and ask them if they know the password. And last I heard, they, she hadn't heard back. <laughs> what the fuck? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so then they have uh, uh, choices. Um, yeah, and this is, so this is looking at the, this, this is the, what the, all this stuff here is what the um, USB stick looks like, I think. Okay. Yeah. So that's looking from the uh, USB stick, and then this one here is the Windows disk. Isn't it? Oh no, blocker. This one MFS the SDB is the Windows disk, and SDA is the um, Ubuntu with my EFI, my home, and my root partition. Yeah. Okay. Um, what? Only a 10 key root partition. Like, okay, that's tiny. Root partition is really nice. I said I set it to 20. Hmm. Oh, that, that's available. So. Oh, yeah. There's something there. Yeah, I, I've set it to uh, 25 or something, didn't I? That's so. Pretty that's pretty nice. That's pretty yeah. much the way Yeah. Um, and uh, this was me just making grub, uh, and this was the grub disable OS prover equals false. Okay, if I turn it to true, it will add um, to my grub menu. It will add the uh, Windows disk. False. If you set it to false, it will. Oh uh, yeah, right. Oh yeah, to see if it finds Windows disk. Yeah, if I set it to false, and and so it, but from the grub menu, if I didn't try and boot the Windows disk, it won't boot. <laughs> because it's encrypted? Uh, um, you should look because Windows expects to see its own boot loader, and grub knows about that, so it does a chain load, what it call a chain load. Uh -huh. So it pretends I'm the BIOS, and you're the boot loader, and you've just been run from the BIOS. Mm -hmm. So the Windows boot loader never knows that it's come from grub. It thinks it's come straight from the virus. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't have any luck, but maybe it was the encryption. Um, it, it, it would mean then, you see, I've got things like um, legacy support off, and, and doesn't it want some password or something from the BIOS? UEFI, um, like it, it had a Microsoft certificate enabled or something. So it's expecting some certificate to be passed from the firmware to 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 the Windows, and, and I guess that wasn't coming through. But the point was, it, it, when it got to that grub menu, it says um, that one of the choices is load UEFI firmware, okay? Which is, in other words, 
kind of like go into the BIOS. So, so, so it, that takes you um, back into the BIOS, and, and then you can say F9 for a boot menu, and then you can boot Windows. So, so you can actually still boot, still boot, but but you're having to, you can't do it from the Grub menu, or I couldn't. Yeah. So I mean, they turned that back on to true, so that it didn't put a menu item in a grub menu that didn't work. Yeah. And uh, one of the things um, I don't know whether this is just an HP thing, but normally with if you're building an HP system and you push escape, then it takes you into the BIOS. Right? No, it takes you to a firmware menu which says, do you want F10 for setup, F9 for boot menu, F12 for network boot, or something like that. Okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but, but with HP, it's escape. It takes you to that menu, and then, then you can go into your setup or whatever you want to do. Um, now, when you put in Ubuntu and things, and Grub, then the escape menu um, uh, um, is what, when is it, when system boots, the, the escape menu is what takes you to Grub, if, if you haven't got Grub automatically loading. Oh, okay. Yeah. If, so if Grub is hidden, mm -hmm. and, and you just automatically boot up, then when you're booting, you push escape, and it takes, shows the Grub menu. Mm -hmm. And then, so then you need, on the Grub menu, you have to have a UEFI firmware mm -hmm. option, so that you can get into the UEFI firmware, and then you can go to uh, F10 for setup or F9 for boot menu. Yeah. Does that depend on when you press it? Because oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Sometimes you miss. And the other thing is that happens is if you push it too many times, it goes to advanced oh. of the grub, and you've got to go back to the, the main screen because two escapes is one to bring up the grub menu and one to go into the advanced. Menu, I yeah, um, I did have a computer recently that I fixed, and that that um, it was designed to have two displays, and the nasty thing was it it would <laughs> it would be default to um, when it booted the grub menu went to the display you couldn't see, <laughs> and it would sit there for thirty seconds because that was a timeout on grub, okay, and. Uh, I, I, would, I would look at the disk drive light, and it would, it, it, I'd see it go flash, flash, that, that to, oh, that's must have boot and grub, but it's not appearing on the screen. And then if I hit enter, it would start to boot Ubuntu, you know, or, so, so, I knew, so I knew it was working, <laughs> yeah. Or, or if I just sat there for 30 seconds, and then I would see it would start to flash, saying it was booting Ubuntu. Um, so, well, yeah, in, in, in fact, I, I, I fitted that and got it to ignore. It had two chips. One chipset was for one display. That's the. Uh, I, I was responsible for setting. Yeah, Simon's one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Simon. Uh, the, the, the reason that happened uh, is yes. it's like my laptop, too, uh, uh. came out. Uh, at the same time as um, what was the Microsoft D, 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 uh, Vista? Vista, yeah. Oh. It came out at Vista and the, the, uh, the batteries were too. Oh, okay. So, uh, some of the, my one, which is a, uh, uh, which is a Sony. Yeah, this one of the signs, they had two chips. One was uh, for uh, long battery length, and uh, the other for high uh, performance. Yeah. And, and you could switch between the two, and, and, and the bias, which is a god awful bias. So that's why, yeah. that's why, that's why they did it, uh, uh. so that you could. I don't, I don't have a long battery time or, uh, 
or a decent performance. Right. <laughs> but you couldn't have both. Right. right. Yeah, well, I think in the end, I had to go into the bias and, and do something like disable dual graphics chips or something like that. So I only had one graphics chip. And then I had to go into the grub menu and, and say something about the console. And, and then I got a console display. And, and, and then I sent the timer on to three seconds. So it, 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 would, it, would, it would, rather than display to the other graphics chip, it would at least display to the, to the, the window you can see, you know, the display you can see. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was a bit of a puzzle as to, because I could see the lights flashing, I knew something was happening, but um, it was like, what is, what is it displaying? Yeah. I thought it was coming out the back port, you know, I was worrying about plugging another monitor out the, into the uh, external port for SVGA to see, see might have worked, might have seen something. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, it must have been just for a limited, I hadn't struck computers with two, two graphics. Yeah. Okay, well, I think. Oh. I actually still think that this still happens if you have like a, an integrated chipset plus like an NVIDIA graphics card on a laptop. And I think on, on, on Linux, you still have to decide which one you want to use before you start. Windows can automatically switch between the two of them. Yeah. Yeah, I think actually um, yeah, there's a special Windows driver that gets downloaded and, and that particular driver doesn't exist for well, whatever chipsets that I had for Linux. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so um, yeah, that's right. I, I, I did kind of look into it. My so, laptop's got a special uh, Google BIOS. Yeah. It can switch between the two. Or, or the Windows driver can switch between the two. Right. But the uh, Linux can't. Linux doesn't seem to be able to do So you have to put it to one setting to boot Linux. You can't have it on alter, alternate the settings. Or well, whichever one, <laughs> uh, whichever one is, uh, it just defaults to the, oh. uh, the built-in. Yeah. Uh, um, Okay. And anyway, um, one of the things that when you have booted up a system or you want to check, there's a little command that just looks for the directory EFI and it either comes back saying EFI or BIOS to, to, um, so that you know um, have you booted up a, a UEFI system or a, a um, MBR system. So I think that was about it. I think there was one thing I put at the bottom of one of these screens, which was a little reminder. <coughs> ah, yeah. I found there was no, um, what did I find? There was no uh, group, yeah, user and group thing. But also, the startup disk creator is not, not in the, normally in that, um, this, menu here, you have startup disk creator. But, um, well, you used to a couple of releases back. But um, they've stopped putting the startup disk creator as part of the package. So um, if you, you know, might want to put that on. And another thing that's a bit bizarre, I'm pretty sure, I'll just come out of here. Search for it. Oh, well. In the system where you find the What? Um, accessories. I don't know about my page, but the. Oh, um, if I go Control or T. Um, is it called? I don't know what it's. Dad X. No. Um, USD Creator GTK. I guess it's just called USB Creator dot common. So, but where was that USB? 
There's much common files for GNOME for KDE. Creators. It's not showing that it's installed though, is it? I'll just try putting it in. Um, I'll put in the K GTK one, should I? For no, I'll put in that. Yeah, the GTK one. We'll see whether it adds it to that. Um, if I go to. What is it? Um, Control panel, control center. Yeah, startup just created, it's been added. Yeah. yeah. And I think um, there's no G parted as well. There's a, yeah, so that G part is not. And yet the USB stick that you install Marte with has GPART. You know, when you try Ubuntu uh, with from the USB stick, the, the live has GParted. But when you install uh, that USB stick to to the hard disk, GParted doesn't come across, which is a bit, you know, you think if it's if it's, I'm also stick it in. And kind of all right, isn't it? Because you have installed your system, so you shouldn't need to partition it anymore. <laughs> Otherwise, you just screw it up. But it's interesting. It looks like they've removed a lot of installs that are you or have been coming by default, yeah. and really sort of like remove things in the admin thing. So now I've got G part in. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what package was it? Yeah. Um, Gparted can be handy if you want to, you know, if, you, if I want to add a, um, you know, I, I squeeze the data disk down and I put another partition in there and I install Mongero or something like that just to try mm. it out. Yeah, that's when I would use Gparted, mm. just squeezing things around. Of course. I managed to screw up the partitions on the disk. Mm -hmm. And I knew what I had to put, put them back to. If, I knew if I could restore it, I could get back the file because the, the volume hadn't been wiped or anything. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it, wouldn't let me get down to the sector level to get it there because I think the right place. And I had to do something else with it, it was SF disk or CF disk or something like that. But part of it, not G part of it, but part of it, which I think was the two underlying G part of it, Tom's still listening. Um, no, Tom's on. Oh, I think. Oh, well, mm. I was going to say he's, he's put in Linux Mint 20, which is based on Ubuntu 2204. Mm. <laughs> Probably this month or next month will be Linux Mint 21, which will be based on 2204. So you'll have to upgrade Linux Mint from um, from 20 to 21. And I'm pretty sure one of the reasons why I don't use Linux Mint is um, is when you do a, a release, an upgrade from say what like 20.1 to 20.2 is nothing is required but if you go from 20 to 21 then there's actually a utility that you download from Linux Mint and that controls it does manages the upgrade oh, okay. right and what I when I did that it would ask me questions like maybe it takes an hour but it, like after 15 minutes, it's the first question, and then another 15 minutes, another question. Oh. If I've got 20 systems like that, I don't, 
I want to go to lunch <laughs> and come mm. back and they're all finished. I don't want to be sitting there going around the in circles, going around 20 computers going, yes, continue, or yes, continue. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, can, you, can you set up a script for it and then it'll get its answers from there and you can just go in? Maybe, but um, you know, I, I Why, yeah. didn't have time. The whole package management or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I, I don't know why. It's, I think it's only with major releases. Normally with the dot releases or whatever. Um, or maybe I could go from 18 to 19, but I couldn't go from 19 to 20. Maybe there was, it was, it was some, some, some issue like that. But fortunately, I were only eight computers, so it wasn't, wasn't too horrendous. But I thought, boy, if I had 20 of these, I would, I would be, I'd be out the door. Mm. Okay, so Peter, that, that's yep. probably the presentation. I don't know whether. Yeah, no. Thank you very much.